1,800 dead, 53,000 emergency room injuries. How is it to emergency? section of the West Grand Freeway has come down. 1,500 completely collapsed buildings. 300,000 buildings. Red tagged after the earthquake. This apartment building went over two feet and dropped down 12. Disruption to the water system that's going to take six months to get water back into all the homes. We don't have enough water. Complete shutdown of the electric grid. And fires triggered by the event that will get out of control. Five out, tech for your ETA. There will be so many fires, we won't have enough capacity to fight them. Engine 12, in service on air. We're here to talk about the big one. My name is Lucy Jones, and I'm a seismologist who studies natural disasters and their impact on people. No earthquakes are predictable. If somebody tells you they know an earthquake is coming, they aren't using science to do it. And as far as we can tell, it's a random distribution. Every year has about the same probability. So we don't know which one's next. For instance, the San Andreas here in California, any point on the fault, it's usually about 100 to 150 years between earthquakes. But that doesn't mean every 150 years we get an earthquake. It means every year has about a 1% chance of having the earthquake. At this point, we have not been able to find anything different about how a magnitude 1 begins or how a magnitude 7 begins. They seem to begin in the same way. Yeah, this is an emergency in San Francisco. What happened? Uh, there's a hell of an earthquake. So for prediction to ever be possible, there has to be information in the Earth about how big an earthquake will be before it begins. And the data is looking like the magnitude is determined dynamically during the event which means the Earth does not have that information before it begins. It's not the solution. The question of whether earthquake prediction will ever be possible is hotly debated. I think I'm coming down on the it's theoretically impossible side. Earthquakes really are fundamentally random. And just about all the crazy stuff comes from people trying to make a pattern. My dog really does know they must happen in the early morning. This is earthquake weather. Every one of those is a desire to make a pattern in what's fundamentally random. Animals do not know any better than we do when an earthquake is coming. They do sometimes feel the beginning of the earthquake before we less sensitive humans feel the strongest part. Earthquakes have P and S waves. The S wave is the ground moving this way, and the P wave is the ground moving this way. Both of them get generated by slipping on the fault, but they then travel out at different speeds. In an earthquake, the S waves are always larger and do most of the damage, and the P waves always travel faster. We have found that animals are sometimes more perceptive about the P wave. The time between P and S wave increases as five miles per second from the earthquake. So if you're 15 miles away from the earthquake, there will be three seconds between the waves. The animal feels the P wave, jumps up and reacts. Three seconds later, you feel the S wave, and you think, oh, he knew what was coming. We want a pattern. We tend to see it. And that one piece of reality that's a few seconds warning turns into a belief that they can do it over longer time periods. And it's an interesting psychological aspect of people that we think prediction is the solution. Oh my god, we're having an earthquake. Wait a minute. Hold on, hold on. Can you feel that? There's many, many ways we could classify earthquakes. One of the breakdowns that we do is saying which direction the fault moves. And so we have a thrust fault where it dips at an angle and one side moves up and over the other. Then we have a normal fault where it's dipping again, but now the top one moves down and away. So a thrust fault brings things closer together. A normal fault stretches them out. And then a strike-slip fault is where they're vertical and one side just moves past another. Every earthquake moves across a little piece of fault. It begins at a point, that's the hypocenter, and then it ruptures down the fault, just like if you were tearing a piece of paper, you would start at one end and tear down rather than trying to pull the whole thing at once. And if it moves a little distance, then it's a little earthquake. If it keeps on moving, it's a larger earthquake. None of those affect what they do to you. 
the only thing that really matters to a human being is how big the earthquake is, which is telling you how big a piece of fault is moving, and how close you are to that piece of fault. If the fault is dipping at an angle, maybe it's pretty close to you straight down. Residents who live here say they heard what sounded like a bomb when the freeway came down. The Northridge earthquake dipped at an angle under the San Fernando Valley, so everybody in the western San Fernando Valley was literally on top of the earthquake. It's only that distance to the fault that really matters. Violence shaking almost like an explosion. At one point I was thrown down. I think that's when the two top floors came down the first. When we have talked about how to make a building survive earthquakes, the definition has become don't collapse. Because if the building absolutely collapses, if we lose the walls, the roof comes down, that's very likely to kill you. So that's the definition that the building code asks for. To be usable, you need to do more than not collapse. You need to have enough integrity left in the building that you can repair it and not worry about it coming down in the next aftershock. One of the things that I'm doing at this point is helping people understand what the building code gives them and advocating for moving towards a functional recovery standard, a building that can recover its function after the earthquake rather than just a life safety standard. You're far more likely to be murdered in California than die in an earthquake. We're maybe talking 30 people a year on average. I mean, many years without any and one year with, with quite a few, but it's still way below what we do from traffic accidents or guns or, or you know, hamburgers <laughs> you know, and heart attacks. We're gonna need some trucks down here as soon as you can get them. In the biggest earthquakes, there are always fires that are triggered by the event. <laughs> One study went through and looked at the rate and causes of fires after previous earthquakes and came up with an estimate of how many fires per thousand households that receive some level of shaking. From that estimate, we came up with 1,600 fires large enough to call the fire department being triggered by the San Andreas earthquake in Southern California. And of those, 1,200 would grow beyond the capacity of one fire engine to respond. We don't have that many fire engines in Southern California, and our estimate that some of them would grow and that the losses from the fires would be comparable to the direct shaking losses in the original event. You know, when you look back in history at what has happened, when you have a really big earthquake in a dense urban environment, we always see fires. You look back in 1906 in San Francisco or 1923 in Tokyo and the fires devastated, destroyed the cities and the aftermath of the earthquake. The other big issue for California, of course, is that we don't have enough water where our people are and we have established aqueduct systems to bring the water to our people. There are four aqueducts feeding Southern California. Every one of them crosses the San Andreas Fault in the area expected to move in the one big earthquake. The Hetch Hetchy Reservoir coming into the Bay Area crosses the Hayward Fault to get into the area in that region. And when we say that an earthquake happens on a fault, that means that fault moves, which means that one side is now 10, 20, 30 feet away from the other, depending on exactly how much motion there is. Any aqueduct or pipe crossing that will be broken. Every road crossing it will be broken. But there are ways that we could be going in and strengthening those crossings, making them more resilient. I mean, how do you handle a 20-foot offset? That requires some pretty significant engineering. But it's been done before. The Alaska pipeline crossed the Denali Fault. When it was put in the 70s, the geologists went, wait a minute, that's where the fault is. It's going to be broken. Imagine spilling out all of that crude across the tundra. It's an ecologic disaster and they had to come up with a solution. They built it on sliders, and that earthquake actually did happen in 2002, and the pipeline did not break. There was 18 feet of offset, and it didn't break. So we know how to do it. One factor in the water problem is getting water into our area. But then we have to get the water into our homes and businesses, and that happens through distribution pipes. Those are some of the oldest infrastructure in a city because it's the first thing you put in before you build the buildings. 
They tend to be brittle. For a long time in California, we use what were called AC pipes. Very brittle and cracks up in earthquakes. And then there's sewer lines running beside them and they crack too and you get cross contamination and all sorts of things. So the possibility for widespread disease and contamination is really significant. The cholera in Haiti was a result of, of that structure. We have the potential for cholera or typhoid or a lot of these other diseases coming through in California when we have a real disruption to our water system. Tsunamis follow some earthquakes. The earth shaking does not make a tsunami. It can make seishing. You can get sloshing. Think about a bathtub if you shake the bathtub, you can get the water moving back and forth. Tsunamis happen when you change the shape of the seafloor during an earthquake. And therefore, if you've got a big fault that moves up on the seafloor, the water that used to be there gets pushed out of the way, and that's the tsunami. The biggest tsunamis, the type of thing that we have seen in Japan or in Indonesia, only happen when you move a really big fault. You need a magnitude eight and a half to nine to create the type of tsunamis that can cross the Pacific Ocean and do damage on the other side. The only fault capable of that in the lower 48 is the Cascadia subduction zone from Cape Mendocino up to British Columbia. Alaska also has these type of subduction faults that can produce the big earthquakes. The 9.2 in 1964 in Alaska created a tsunami that killed people in California. California, the lower part of California, we don't have those really big faults offshore, so we're never going to create those really big tsunamis. It looks like, this is the best that we can tell so far, that there are at least two faults I can't predict an earthquake before it begins, but I can tell you that you will be receiving shaking very soon because of an earthquake that is already underway, but the waves haven't gotten to you yet. And we call that concept earthquake early warning. It requires a network of a lot of stations that can see the earth moving here. If you are right where the earthquake begins, you're the one providing the information to everybody else so you don't get a warning. It's limited usefulness, but it's real. We've got windows and everything that's falling out. Can you feel that? There go the lights. Early warning is really not prediction. Early warning is the shaking's already begun. Here's when it's going to get to you. The big things that we want to do with early warning are things like bringing an alarm in every operating room and dentist's office so they get the drill out of your mouth, so they get the scalpel out of your chest before they get jerked. Move the elevator to the nearest floor and open the door so you aren't caught when the electricity goes out for the next three days. When the great East Japan earthquake happened, magnitude nine, they had earthquake early warning. No trains derailed because no train was still moving when the earthquake came through, because the early warning system was used to stop all trains across the northern part of the country. Many people are afraid of dying in the earthquake, but we need to be much more worried about the aftermath than what happens during the earthquake itself. You'll almost undoubtedly survive the big one, but afterwards we're gonna be dealing with damaged buildings, disrupted infrastructure, lack of potable water, rampaging fires, disruption of all of our businesses. And getting through that is what's gonna determine what happens to our communities. Earthquake preparations are a sliding scale. Wherever you are, there's more you could do and the more it will cost. 